Good morning to everyone and welcome to this CyberBricks webinar on uh, 5G regulation standards, surveillance and ideology. My name is Luca Belli, I'm professor at FGV Law School where I had the Center for Technology and Society and also the CyberBricks project. And I really have uh, the great honor of having with us today uh, two excellent speakers, Vanessa Copetti Crowell, who is cybersecurity specialist at Anatel, the Brazilian Telecoms Regulator, and Neil Stenover, who is uh, both a uh, researcher at the University of Amsterdam, researching digital uh, and internet infrastructures, and also one of our new CTS FGV visiting professors. The team of today is uh, 5G regulation, standards, surveillance, and ideology. Before we start, let me just uh, reiterate that, of course, all the opinions that are stated during this webinar are the speaker's opinions and do not reflect in any way the opinion of CTS FGB or FGB in general, of course. And uh, so the, this issue of FGV has been <clears throat> emerging as a core issue of digital policies and politics in Brazil over the past couple of years, uh, especially uh, over the past months with uh, great media attention on the arrival of 5G as this has been defined by uh, local media. And the, the, the uh, webinar of today is precisely about understanding what really is happening and which kind of uh, which kind of regulation has been adopted, which kind of policy evolution uh, we have witnessed over the past uh, couple of years, especially at the Brazilian and international level, to shed also a little bit of light on the technicalities of 5G and the conceptions we have of 5G. Something that we all know is that 5G is not a mere software update. It's a different technology that requires a lot of investments. And it is why a lot of specialists are have been a little bit skeptical about the so-called arrival of 5G, uh, because the arrival of 5G, the, the, the adoption of 5G, uh, really entails a lot of investments and planning. And uh, the impression is that, at least for the first years, we will have deployment of 5G, uh, especially, of course, when there is return on, on investment, right? So the, the, the most densely populated and wealthy areas of the largest cities or the sector of the economy where there is return on investment and where 5G can uh, facilitate automation like uh, industrial internet, massive internet of things, or, uh, or smart cities in which there is a substantial uh, uh, return on investment. But this, of course, leads to a, a, an evolution uh, where automation, on the one hand, uh, makes redundant the use of humans for a workforce, and on the other hand, enormously expands the surface of potential cyber attacks uh, by connecting an incredible amount of devices uh, in uh, a very large number of sectors of the, the economy. Uh, and this really needs leads us to the three main questions we want to reply and to answer during uh, this webinar. The, the first is, uh, well, how which kind of digital divides may the arrival of 5G create? Uh, knowing that the 5G will, will, of course, be deployed primarily in the richest, wealthiest areas and the richest and wealthiest sectors. The other is which kind of cybersecurity uh, threats may create, and we will see that the Brazilian reply has been very uh, interesting and solid in this regard with the adoption of the new cybersecurity regulation for the telecom sector. And then last but not least, is this kind of conceptualization of 5G that is leading to a sort of concentration of uh, digital infrastructures, the only type of conceptualization that we might have, or can we use uh, uh, 5G technologies in different ways from what we have been using so far or thinking so far, and this is really a, a, a new uh, avenue of research we are hoping to, to open with our friend Niels. And so without further ado, 
I would like to first uh, give the floor to Vanessa uh, to give us a provide us an overview of the uh, most recent Brazilian uh, uh, evolutions. Please, Vanessa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luca, and good morning to all uh, participants. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Cypress Bricks Project. And it's a pleasure to be here to Professor, Professor Niels. So um, I think you raised uh, several excellent points regarding uh, 5G setting the scene for us here. And what I'm going trying to do is to explain a little, a little bit of uh, how Anatel is dealing with cybersecurity and how does it relate to 5G. So I'm just going to share my screen just a minute. So I hope you all can see it now. Perfect. So just to start, so uh, Anatel is the Brazilian telecom regulator for, uh, uh, for telecommunications. So uh, we don't have a specific mandate for cybersecurity with, for example, in the sense that we are not the national coordinator for this. So we have a mandate for the telecommunication sector, which is uh, very important to, to bear in mind when we are discussing this subject. So we have a very important role making sure that our telecommunications network are uh, secure and resilient. And this also include the protection of critical infrastructure, infrastructure. And how do we do that? We do that through regulation. So we do have a specific regulation on cybersecurity that we are going to explain very, very, um, you know, very brief to you. Also, we do that also looking through the technology. So we have, uh, we have some uh, procedures in place regarding um, uh, the equipment. So we do have a net that establishes minimum required requirements for cybersecurity. And now even we have that is still open a public consultation that making these requirements mandatory for certifications for purposes, which means that a product to be able to go to the Brazilian market also we will have to encompass some of these mandatory requirements. And also we are trying to foster awareness within the sector, also engaging not only Anatel, but engaging all the players to do awareness um, on, on this matter. So when it comes to our regulation, uh, it's, it can be like dividing two main blocks. So we do have some provisions for the telcos and these will include, for example, principles, guidelines, and also mandatory provision they do have to observe. But we also have um, uh, a whole block of discussion on how Anatel is going to address cybersecurity and mostly how we are going to do this governance within the sector. And also, um, and this is where we create the cybersecurity technical group, which I'm also one of the coordinators of these and is, uh, is led by the head of the compliance department of Anatel. And with no long, long uh, just to, to give you a brief overview of the mandatory provisions that Telco do have to, to, to comply with, they do have to have a policy on cybersecurity, which means they also have to do governance on cybersecurity. They do have to publicate the general provisions of the, this policy to the public to be uh, available on their site. They do have to notify the agency on relevant incidents that they suffer um, because we wanted to have a sense of what's going on within our sector. We need to have this information, this diagnosis to be able to do uh, even to consider additional uh, requirements or any other provision related. We, we also are trying to foster an environment that the telcos are comfortable on sharing information between among them. We also have uh, a look on, um, on the supplier chain in the sense that uh, the, the, the telcos only are, um, are allowed to have suppliers that also do have a cybersecurity policies and that also go through audit processes. We have a specific requirement for equipment. We also making sure that they are conducting vulnerability assessment cycles. And finally, they also have to report on their critical infrastructure to the agency. And when it comes about to the, to the governance of cybersecurity within the sector, we have created this uh, cybersecurity 
technical group that also address critical infrastructure. And this group has uh, was born with a lot of um, a, a lot of uh, with a great mandate, a wide role, and includes following up uh, the, the cybersecurity public's compliance, the definition of um, that one needed to the implementation of the regulation. For example, we have come come up with a list of incidents that they do have to mandatory notify the agency. We have to follow up the information sharing procedure. We have to do outreach and engage with relevant entities and bodies. We have to internalize best practices and standards of the several organizations, international organizations and regional ones as well that do uh, create standards and also best practices and guidelines on cybersecurity. We also have our own capacity building and awareness initiatives and developing studies. So it's a quite big role. It's a quite big challenge for us, but we are trying to work very hard that we can meet uh, what we need in cybersecurity. And just to give you a little glimpse of our structure, we do have like a, a wider structure which will be the plenary with Anatel and also the big telcos and also a representation of small providers. And then within this bigger structure, we do have four subgroups that will address cybersecurity policy and if critical infrastructure, another one focus that will focus on uh, cyber, uh, information sharing and best practices, another one to look on the tech side, to look on equipment, on suppliers, and on technical requirements, and finally one to address the international discussions, you, as you you all know and all aware of uh, this uh, this discussion of cyber is uh, is appearing in almost every one of the international organizations and that is why that it's very important that we in a multi stakeholder environment uh, can can have conversations about can elaborate the position that anatel is going to take to some of this forum the ones that uh, anatel has the role to represent brazil and also to coordinate with other entities and organizations of the government but uh, the thing is, so just setting the scene, we have the regulation for cyber that was not created specific for, cyber, for 5G. It was created and it started to be elaborated a little bit before that. But why 5G specific cybersecurity matters so much? So as Luca has mentioned, we, we we are not talking about an evolution here. That's why we don't. We, it's, not, it's not just you no know, evolving from one G to two G to three G to five G. Some pe uh, some some people even question if five G would be the 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 the, the right uh, terminology because it's not a matter of evolving from four G to five G. We have a change, a change with NIF new technical features, we have slicing, we have edge computing, we have a software based networks, we have a massive use of IoT, that's something that also IoT is not new, we were expecting for 4G, but to be true, it was not supported at the level that it, that uh, is needed, so we have this promise of exposing use of uh, of IoT, connecting everyone and everything. And with this, we have this wide attack surface. So, and of course we do, so we, we have this aim or leaving the one behind and connecting everyone, which also, uh, I mean, it must be a priority, but we not only connecting everyone, we are aiming to connect everything. We have different uses, industrial uses. And with this, we are expanding our attack surfaces, which is something that uh, Luca also mentioned. And but not only that, all of these technical uh, features they also will have will bring new challenges that may not even yet discover yet vulnerabilities that were not yet discover, and that maybe we we'll just um, we will discover them when something happens or when we start to massive deployment of 5G. So all these things will bring new challenges when it comes to cybersecurity. And what is the 5G cybersecurity uh, approach uh, as, as a Brazil's approach here? So I think the first one thing to mention is that we don't have the idea of high risk vendors, which is approach that other countries um, uh, do use. 
So this is a concept that do not exist on our regulations in Brazil. What we do have is a public policy that was enacted by the Ministry of Communications before the 5G uh, auction, a spectrum auction in Brazil in last year, that we do have a restriction from companies to participate in the private network of the federal government that is going to be created. So we don't, uh, it's important to, to, to understand that we don't have today any restriction to vendors in our networks. We are going to have a specific restriction for this net federal network that is going to be implemented. And is also in the, the design phase. Uh, and, and when it goes to, to the, the action note, uh, the call for bid, uh, that was um, was published last year, you're going to see that security appears twice as the, in this document with two perspectives. One perspective is quality as security, uh, um, a feature of the, 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 the wider sense of, uh, of the quality of service that is provided to the user. And also we should include confidentiality in all this uh, in, in this sense. But also we do have a provision that stating that all the, the, the providers will have to comply with the cybersecurity regulation. And uh, to, to finalize, I'm already, I know that I reached my time, but I, I just wanted to bring to your attention one thing that we are very proud of. We have, uh, Anatel has um, celebrated a research cooperation agreement with one federal university with a specific grant specific for cybersecurity on 5G. So this was uh, celebrated in December of the last year. It, so it's a 20 month project. It's on the ongoing project. It's going to research on cybersecurity for the telecommunications network, especially in 5G. But it also will cover the legacy networks because as Luca mentioned, this is not going to, we're not gonna make a shift that we are from tomorrow, we are going to start 5G. For many years, we are going to have the legacy 3G, 4G, as well as 5G SL with the increased deployment of 5G. And this, this agreement will uh, basically be, um, cover three perspectives, one that focuses on identifying the main characteristics and the mention of security in the telecom uh, networks. Then we will focus also in all these new features that 5G brings, but focus on the cybersecurity challenges and opportunities of these features. And finally, uh, um, a perspective that will cover the economic standardization and also regulatory uh, perspectives. And we believe that this will bring very valuable inputs for Anatel in order to adapt, to create, and to connect new uh, requirements uh, or regulations. And with this, I finish mine and I take, and I thank you very much for this opportunity to share these comments with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vanessa. This is really interesting. And actually, it's very, uh, interesting to see also how the, the the approach of Anatel, which is very into a multi-stakeholder governance approach, uh, not only in the in a, in a, in a to pay lip service to multi-stakeholderism as many institutions usual usually do, but it's really concretely implement baking this into its governance and especially in the cybersecurity governance, not only with uh, cybersecurity assessment and and and, uh, and uh, audit processes required uh, from the players of the market, but also by uh, continuously uh, having a dialogue with academic uh, actors. And this project you were mentioning uh, with the University of Campina Grande is, is really interesting. It's very interesting also to have also this continuous dialogue with you and your availability to. Uh, communicate and share the latest updates and really i'm sure that this uh, will will be a very uh, a very interesting uh, relationship in the future to try to explore further how anatel is is uh, defining and regulating cybersecurity not only with the, with regard to 5g but in general and as you were mentioning not only looking at the five, fifth uh, generation of mobile internet but also the previous one and the future one with the arrival of 6g 
uh, in the next in the coming future. Uh, now uh, it's I think it's the best moment to give the floor to Neil Stenover, who is really working a lot on infrastructures in general and has some very interesting thoughts on how we should approach 5G and what is 5G indeed. Please, Niels, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks so much, uh, uh, Luca, and thanks so much, uh, FGV CTS, for uh, hosting me as a fellow here. But also thanks so much to uh, be in conversation with Anatel. I've been following and researching infrastructures and networks for years. And all these governance and standards bodies, Anatel is a very knowledgeable and very skilled uh, participant in negotiations. And this also is shown again in this presentation. I think Brazil can be very uh, uh, lucky with such a strong uh, regulator with a very strong policy and technical understanding. So I hope I can also contribute something to this uh, uh, to this discussion. So I'm a researcher at the University of Amsterdam with the Inside IT project and a critical infrastructure lab. But what I think is the uh, more relevant, most interesting thing about me to know is that I really like networks. So I've been building computer networks, telecommunication networks for a very long time. Uh, but I'm a philosopher by trade and a, uh, a political scientist and sociologist by training. So I'm a bit of an interdisciplinary Frankenstein. And that's also how I try to study networks from as di many different angles as possible and trying to do so by operating them and see how they work. And that brings me to this important question. So what is 5G? And Whereas you think this might be a relatively simple question, a lot of people have very different answers to this question. And also a lot of very relevant actors have different answers to this question. So if you do a simple scraping of the uh, websites and Instagram profiles of network operators and equipment providers, then uh, 5G is often visualized as a product and also with the color blue. Uh, which is often also the, use, the color used for cybersecurity. So it's, it's uh, and if you do a scraping of the words, then you see things like the future, innovation, technology, ultra connectivity, the world of tomorrow, more links, massive capacity. So we'll just have bigger, better, faster, more. And that is something that you as an, uh, 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 as a consumer should probably want because it's what you have but better. Then again, that's not the only thing 5G is. 5G is, as uh, was said before, is a generation. And this means it's the actual the 10 years that a particular standards body will work on uh, technological standards for telecommunication bodies. And these then get sanctioned by the International Telecom Union, the oldest international organization that exists, exists since 1865. And it's not for nothing that the oldest international organization is, uh, uh, is actually governing networks because networks change society. One of the first examples of that was Great Britain that changed from a colonial to an imperial power through the implementation of the telegraph, which really connected the edges to the center of the network. And that is something we've been seeing continuously in the development of networks is we try to get the edges closer and closer and try to take away as much friction as possible to get the fastest uh, uh, communication going. And 5G stands completely in that uh, tradition. So it's also 10 years of development, both on the side of uh, uh, new radio protocols, but also new core network protocols and new devices. So in these 10 years, we will see a lot of iterations and there are a lot of things that 5G can be used for. So as 3G was a huge iteration when it comes to using data, 5G is a huge iteration when it comes to antenna technology, but also the management of telecommunication network. So 5G is also a convergence of internet networks and telecommunication networks where previously the big switch between the internet and telecommunication networks was that the internet was running on IP, the internet protocol, and was using TCP on top. Well, now with 5G, we're also using IP and TCP and HTTP as uh, protocols in the stack. 
So this also facilitates the internetification of telecoms and the telecomification of the internet. And this was also uh, even accelerated through COVID because the reason why during COVID the networks did not go down was because content distribution networks were available all through the networks. Meaning that if you would be watching a Netflix episode that would not be coming from the Netflix office in the United States, but probably from a data center near you. And while we're trying to get more and more data and more functionality in our networks, we're trying to lower the latency and increase the bandwidth. But there's a problem because there is a maximum speed to, uh, 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 to connectivity. And that is a boundary by physics, sadly, that is the that is the uh, uh, that's the speed of light. So if we want to make that connectivity faster, we need to bring computation and data closer to the user, and that is exactly what we try be trying to do in five G networks through concepts such as edge computation. So we're making the network more intelligent. Well, what does that mean? Well, in previous networks that you might recognize from the phone on the left, the end devices were dumb. They only had uh, uh, 12 uh, options, zero to nine, and a star and a hash. Well, then came computers, which made the network more dumb, only there for the transporting of packets, and the endpoints very smart. And then came, uh, uh, then came uh, smart devices like phones, that actually were a bit less configurable and used more servers in the network. These were still endpoints, but what we're seeing now that we're deploying more and more devices that are actually a bit dumber, that are functioning more as sensors, they need to be in controlled from inside the network. And that is something that 5G networks and private 5G networks actually allow us for and also allow for the operation of factories in uh, with near real-time control, with higher control than Wi-Fi, for instance, can. Well, this means that uh, 5G networks also become more, as Laura Denardis calls it, command and control networks, and not just communication networks. So these networks are not just the basis of our communications, but also from the control from our whole public space and society. And that offers a lot of possibilities. But also, there are threats about this power that is added to the network. And many of you will have looked at the uh, uh, contention between the China and the US about Huawei, which is really quite interesting because we have found Great Britain and the US weakening internet protocols and building in back doors, whereas Huawei has never been found to build in backdoors into their protocols. However, the big rise of Chinese participation of holding patents and, uh, 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 and the participation of Huawei in the 3GPP, the standards body in which 5G is uh, standardized, is causing quite some uh, uh, unrest in, uh, in Europe and North America. However, this is also what we've been telling China to do ever since the 90s, that they should stop copying technology, but build their own telecommunications portfolio and, uh, uh, and develop their own technologies. And that's what they're actually doing right now and beating Europeans and North Americans in their own game. And then something that is not as discussed as much, but that's that we see platforms such as Amazon and Facebook also getting lower and lower in the stack to provide more backends for telecommunication networks. So we really see that everyone is now very interested in these lower infrastructure uh, uh, networks. Because as the scholar Keller Easterling says, the rules of the globalizing world today are not set in the language of law uh, are, or are not set in the law of, in the language of diplomacy, but are set in the language of infrastructure. And that makes it quite interesting to see that at every layer of the 5G stack, there are uh, hooks, APIs for surveillance. And what counter to what you might expect, the, uh, the way that surveillance is standardized in the 3GPP, the standards body in which 5G is defined, 
is that it's done based on the request by European and North American governments. North America indirectly uh, through Tridea works and Europe uh, via directly through Etsy and through uh, direct participation of government requests in the 3GPP. So it's not as a lot of modern discourse uh, uh, suggests that China is standardizing in the 3GPP. However, the lack of Chinese participation might actually cause this angst because of course China will probably do surveillance in its own network, but we don't understand how they do it yet. So instead of trying to push people out of standardization, this might actually be try and possibility to use standardization as a trust building measure in 5G. 5G is also a new use of public space because it's using new part of the spectrum. And the spectrum is a public space that we allow people to have exclusive rights to. So when we're going to auction uh, off uh, a new frequency, such as the 3.5 gigahertz band, but also even higher bands in the futures, we can think of what can these bands, what can these parts of public space do for the citizens of the country, do for the citizens of the world, if we see these networks changing and getting also more power. So one of these, what, one thing that we see with the internet is that there's a re-territorialization of communication networks. And that's a, through an introduction of data localization laws, we're trying to get more control of the data flows that go all over the network. Well, 5G could offer a particularly interesting offer for that because people are maybe not using their devices to program as much and putting that responsibility on citizens to program their end devices might also be putting quite some responsibility in terms of uh, cybersecurity uh, that they might not be able to manage. But there are so many opportunities in terms of edge computing that we could ask of networks, and there might be a possibility uh, for regulators to look into that, to, uh, to pro for, uh, pro for telecommunication uh, providers to offer computation capacity in the network and also to use it for data, data localization inside the network to, uh, to change people that use communication networks from consumers to actually active citizens that host their own services, that run their own services, and does le uh, leverage edge computing and storage for data localization, but also local innovation and uses and facilitation of data trusts. Well, I hope these were some interesting things and ways that we can think about the way 5G changes the networks and power dynamics in the networks, but also how it could provide more citizen connectivity and innovation for uh, both individuals, companies, and communities. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Niels, for this really excellent food for thought. And it, it really uh, is a very good uh, new chapter of research, I guess, on regarding what could be done, uh, the way in which we can understand uh, digital infrastructures and we have indeed witnessed a, a switch <clears throat> and evolution from a, a distributed architecture to a more uh, uh, decentralized architecture and the increasing centralization and consolidation we are witnessing now actually is not something irreversible. Uh, what you the, 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 the point that you bring into the discussion, the fact that you, we can consider this phenomenon of recentralization of networks in through a 5G architecture, uh, we may consider this as something that is centralization and further control in the hands of classical intermediaries like telecom operators, uh, but we can also consider this as something that can be re decentralization and creation of new governance infrastructures, both with regard to connectivity and data management as uh, uh, 5G facilitates edge computing, not necessarily in the hands of classic intermediaries, but also in the hands of other type of uh, even community intermediaries that can help have a different, uh, uh, a different perspective and a different approach to the governance and organization of digital infrastructures. Uh, having said that, I would like to 
uh, open for questions. Actually, I I, I really have a uh, if I, I would like to 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 share my first question for you uh, to to break the ice and then continue our discussion. So my first question would be: How do you think that the interaction interaction between uh, international policies that uh, are set in this moment, and we have seen also only a couple of weeks ago the uh, ITU planning potential meeting going in, in Bucharest. And so how do you think that this is uh, playing out, this, uh, uh, this dialogue between international policies and national, or even if we think uh, Neil's idea, even local, localized governance of telecom infrastructure is, ploy is, is playing out. So what uh, we have to expect in the next uh, in the next uh, years, do, you, do we have to expect a, a further, also with this change at the leadership level of, uh, of the ITU, which is a remarkable change, uh, what do we have to expect? Do you think that there will be uh, more attention to uh, different kind of development, more attention on cybersecurity, how this tension or dialogue will play out between uh, the local and the global level of, uh, of uh, 5G policies. Who wants to, to start? I can start. Please, <laughs> Vanessa. So um, I think this is a quite in a very interesting question. Uh, so as you know, in Brazil, Anatel have a very specific mandate that that it was included in it, the the law that created the agency, saying that Anatel represents Brazil in the telecommunications regional and international organizations. So Anatel uh, conduct and of course coordinate with the uh, with uh, the government now before taking the Brazil's position through this forum, but. Um, Attending this forum and being a part of this negotiation is ve something very usual for us. So we are very, um, uh, it's very natural for us to follow this, uh, this forum specific ITU. I have been to, to Bucharest, to specific to attend the cybersecurity discussions. So um, we are, um, I'm not saying that, that we align everything, but I mean, uh, this internalization process of everything that is decided and everything that we consider that is useful for Brazil, considering our contest, is something that is already, you know, in our blood, in our daily basis job. Uh, but of course, there is the, the everything works both ways. So as we do internalize, but also, we have this huge effort of coordinating the positions that we take to this forum to be also to be considered. And for example, uh, we do have a, a formal instruct, uh, uh, structure, which is called the Brazilians um, uh, Commission, uh, Communications Commission, that also is, um, uh, is created by a resolution within Anatel that formalizes how we do, how, how are the proceedings relating to this representation. And we have taken, for example, a proposal, a specific proposal, a standalone proposal from Brazil to this conference. And, and as well as other proposals, for example, regarding sustainability of space and also regarding open RAN, which are subjects that are, you know, um, are, are very dear to us. And we think that this forum should take into consideration. So uh, we, we see as this, that they, they work both ways. So every country should work to internalize the best practice, of course, take into consideration their context, their national context, but also they have to make sure that their positions also are taken into consideration in the forum. Um, so I think um, Bucharest, yes, has has been a remarkable conference. We have approved um, a, a new mandate to ITU. We have approved a woman that's going to 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 lead the first woman that is going to lead the 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 agency for the next four years. But we also within cybersecurity we had approved. Uh, I specific thematic priorities that include cybersecurity, and this was a huge advance for um, for ITU. You, you may know as uh, well that uh, cybersecurity mandates with international uh, uh, organizations is not something very easy, and not something um, agreed that all membership agree. 
uh, upon. So it, it, it's very difficult and this was a remarkable success uh, to approve a thematic priorities for ITU dealing with cybersecurity and of course with other issues as well as inclusiveness, inclusiveness, but also cybersecurity as a thematic priority is a big change. If, if please, I may, please, yes, please go ahead. So what was so interesting to in being in Bucharest, uh, uh, so, so I wasn't at the previous plenipotentiary, but why was eight years ago in Busan, and like there's uh, uh, there's such a big change. Whereas the the fight used to be about all the internet resolutions, and it was really where are where where can, can multi stakeholder governance and multilateral governance, and it was really, and those fights seem actually to have ossified a bit. It's like, okay, we still we still make the arguments, but that's not where 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 the real thing is. The real fights, as uh, uh, as mentioned, are in open run and space. And this is this is really interesting, right? So it's really the the access layer and not the transport layer. So open run, was there because the three GPP and this is quite interesting. So telecommunication standards have been existing for a very long while, but telecom interoperation hasn't been that good for many services. So we uh, uh, and you all have experienced this while trying to send SMS. And the early SMS would only send within your uh, uh, if you would send it to your own operator then it would work across operators. And then if you would send an international one, yes or no, and then MMS by sending an image, that would almost never work, right? And these were just simple consumer facing standards. Well, and there are many more standards that might provide functionality inside a network, but across coordination has not been that good. And Open Run has been an initiative to break this open, to really create uh, interoperable stacks also to ensure that if you can build a network that you can use equipment from different manufacturers and with that you can build more heterogeneous networks because you can prov you can configure your network in new ways right and this this opens this 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 huge possibility and what and this is in part driven that processor speeds have gone up memory prices have gone down and are much faster so a lot of the implementation of telecommunication infrastructure is now on general purpose hardware and then implemented through network function virtualization and software defined networking so yes we need new antennas for beam forming and like very interesting new technologies but the way we then manage the network is mostly implemented in software which means it be, the, the networks become much more manageable and uh, uh and configurable to accommodate for many new things and the question then is what are we going to do with that and how are we going to make that and how are we going to ensure that 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 actually happens right that we're going to help push uh uh, uh and bring it home that what we learned from the internet which was massive interoperability that we can bring that to the telecom world but we also seen that the internet has also slowed down a bit in terms of innovation and also has now built up some technical depth. I mean, we've been trying to adopt IPv6 for, what is it, over 25 years now, and we're not even at 50 plus percent. And the other half, 50% is gonna be probably really hard to get, to get there because we had the easy parts and that took us 25 years, right? So how are we going to now use telecom networks that do upgrade regularly, that's the uh, that's the nice thing about telecommunication networks. Now, how do we harness uh, the best of both worlds in offering new ways in uh, in connecting the whole world? And that's a big that's a big question uh, uh, that is there, and that I think that we'll see also in the aligning of these two uh, of these two regimes. So I think uh, the three GPP is a very good example of that, where it's private standard setting that is then also sanctioned by the ITUT. So you see, I think a bit more meta governance of multi-stakeholder internet governance and multilateral internet governance and how they provide different functions uh, to each other. A question there is though, civil society participation. So uh, in the 3GPP, there are little to no civil society participation. If people participate, mostly is actually done in, uh, uh, in agreements 
uh, behind closed doors. So if you if you go to the IETF, there is a lot of very visible contention. And you also see this on the mailing list. In the 3GPP, you hardly see public contention because people take it off the list. And that also makes influence and understanding how these networks on which we build our information society, how they are shaped, the leaves, uh, 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 leaves room for improvement. And I think there we have uh, uh, things with you. Just, just uh, catching about the open ran. I think this, uh, this is quite interesting. Uh, uh, just sharing a little bit. We uh, in Anatel we like groups, and we also created a technical group on open ran. And uh, the idea was to get together and to to have um, uh, um, an an idea of what is happening inside of Brazil, and also aggregating all the stakeholders. And we have seen that we have many already solutions already deployed in the sense uh, and and we have um, talked to many stakeholders many initiatives many organizations from all sectors and sectors but we also has uh, have celebrated and uh, give a grant to another university also to do research on up and around similarly as we have done from uh, uh, with cybersecurity and 5G, we have a specific one with University of Brasilia to, to study up and run. Uh, this is something that uh, we believe that the input from academia is quite important. We, we don't have uh, in the private, uh, the, the, not, not only private sector, not only uh, the public sector, it uh, has all the inputs that are needed to, to the discussion. So we are, um, we are quite confident that the, this input from academia in all our discussions is very important. And this is something that we are very committed and we are trying to, to enforce in, in the last months and also in the upcoming, we are also going to have new projects with different uh, institutions following uh, these digital discussions. Just sharing yeah. a little bit. That's 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 really fascinating to hear because what I what 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 also leaves maybe some room for improvement in open run is actually the openness, <laughs> because there is not a word that has been used in so many different ways as openness, right? So so not all meetings are necessarily uh, recorded or publicly archived. Not all open run code or reference implementations are open source. And that makes the public learning and the public implementation, let alone open hardware, of course. So, so like I think we, if we're really going to build our information societies on that, I think that is a lesson that we can learn from the internet, where a lot of the implementations were open source, but also like really helped improve the services and also enable innovation and also innovation that uh, uh, that benefits citizens and end users. Excellent. And I actually, it's, it's, it was very interesting to, to uh, hear you because I was really thinking about the very uh, relevant role that Brazil also played over the past decades in terms of uh, promoting multi-stakeholder governance and participation at the international level, not only at the national level, which is something that has been always in the DNA of uh, of Brazilian digital policy making, uh, and that perhaps over the past uh, years has been a little bit lost, especially the the relevant role that Brazil was playing internationally, but that. that, that most likely will will come back again uh, with a more relevant international agenda of the uh, of the next government. Uh, now, something a, a point, a question, let's say, or a, a forecast uh, from you that I would like to 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 have before we we get towards the end of this webinar is what is the main obstacle? What is the main challenge that uh, the implementation of 5G, the deployment of 5G, uh, if you want, you can connect it to cybersecurity, but also to other uh, uh, dimensions that you might find relevant. So 
we have seen again, as I was mentioning at the very beginning of this webinar, that there is an enormous enthusiasm about the arrival of 5G, but that actually the, the true deployment adoption of 5G will still take some years, uh, at least. And so, what is in your, uh, from your perspective, both as a regulator, uh, Vanessa, and as an academic, Niels, what are what are the main challenges ahead? Uh, for a sustainable deployment of, of 5G? Who wants to go first? Uh, I can start and uh, speaking here in, in my behalf, uh, not Anatel's views, but uh, I think managing the expectation of consumers, it's, it's quite uh, an important issue. Uh, of course, we have seen the deployment in the capital, but uh, it, it's comparing to the, the whole areas that have to be covered, it's, it's really small. And it's going to take a lot of years that we can usually have the 5G experience, the one that was sold to us, you know, that we can all envision and wanted to have. And now, now in the international photo, we are trying to, to start discussing the vision for 6G, right? But we don't have quite yet the, the really vision of 5G, the one that was promised, the one that the definitions of technologies allow us to speak. So I think that this is complicated, but of course we have the cost of, of this implementation of all this equipment that has to be poured or this, this, uh, this uh, base station. So this of course is something uh, that also, and this is an interesting question that we can also relate to and connect to open run discussion. Because we also do have a promise that using um, uh, open RAN for this uh, this section of the the, the 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 infrastructure, the radio open access part of the of uh, of the networks that would also uh, will reduce the implementation cost. And this is something quite interesting that we are still um, looking for for the inputs and like more substantive inputs from from academia and from these agreements that to take into consideration. But this also is a promise. You know, this is something that also um, is is um, it's announced as a way to, to reduce in the implementation costs. Actually, if I can chip in before Niels uh, provides his answer, I, I really concur with what Vanessa was mentioning. Uh, I think that maybe uh, that is not only a Brazilian peculiarity. I I would say in probably almost all countries, uh, the great announcements about five G. May uh, be may create sort of backlash towards five five G, and that is not really strategic because it's a technology that has a lot of potential. But announcing that five G is arriving and that in uh, in the next couple of months you will have, or you can already purchase an internet connection that is extremely fast and extremely reliable. When this actually is something that only a very a uh, tiny minority of the population can afford, and in, in even less uh, part of, even smaller part of the population uh, de facto has uh, the technical uh, conditions to access it because it is not deployed uh, uh, universally yet. And then if you even add on top of this concern, the fact that uh, in countries like Brazil, a very a still substantial portion of the population is not connected, not even to three or four G, right? So this is that the re, there is really the potential on the one hand to create a new, new types of digital divides, highly connected uh, individuals, or even uh, uh, in, in industrial uh, sectors and very poorly connected uh, parts segments of the population. Or of the economy, uh, but on the other hand, this really can create a sort of backlash. We have seen in again, not uh, to mention only Brazil, but other very developed country like the U.S., where the the uh, deployment of 5G has been uh, quite a fiasco because the, it, there has been deployment in a very rich neighborhood in the main cities. But if this is only only delegated to, to the private sector, we know that there are uh, a lot of uh, areas that are traditionally by the doctrine defined as market failure areas, but precisely because the market fails to connect these areas. And this brings me to the final conclusion, which is, I mean, shouldn't this be part, substantial part of the industrial policy 
of a country. I mean, we here in at the CyberBricks project, we study a lot. Other examples that are not necessarily the most studied, like China and India or Russia, and this, I mean, uh, deployment of digital infrastructure is a key component of uh, of uh, uh, plans like Digital India, or we can see that uh, countries like like China or South Korea, which are at the forefront of the five G deployment, really consider this as a key priority for industrial policy, and so maybe. The a further hope that we might have also in the for the for the upcoming uh, years is really the st government starting to consider the deployment of network infrastructure as a key pillar of their industrial policy and not only something ancillary that could be beneficial for consumers to watch Big Brother Brazil in super high definition, but actually something that is essential for the uh, evolution of the economy and of society. Uh, Niels, do you, please, your final consideration, consideration, and then we can go towards the wrap up of the of the webinar. Yeah, if I can just like add a little footnote uh, to that, uh, uh, Luca. I I think five G. We should see it as a social innovation platform, and in a sense, we should might be doing trying to undo something that happened in the privatization and commercialization that happened in the 90s, where many of the telecommunication providers were privatized, but also many of the engineers were laid off. And there has been an increasing um, trend, at least what I've studied in the networks I studied in Europe, is that networks were not run by the telecom provider, but actually under a servants level agreement by the network, by the equipment provider. And so the knowledge of running networks is uh, has been decreasing by telecom providers. And I think we're seeing a insourcing back in countries to get the knowledge about our communication platforms back because we're realizing we're going to make our whole societies digital. So we should really understand the foundation on which we build it and we should operate and run it ourselves. And we don't want to operate it simply to connect our citizens as citizens to Big Brother, to uh, to large corp transnational corporations that uh, take the profits and do not pay taxes here and probably not anywhere else, but actually enable innovation and empower our local citizens. And 5G has potential technology to do that and also allows for private networks. So you could imagine 5G community networks, local 5G networks, uh, also because the small cells are much cheaper than the a large one, 128 by 128 uh, uh, antenna. So there are a lot of possibilities, but for that we will need spectrum. But luckily with the interest of, of private 5G networks also for companies, it seems now there is momentum to build it open as we've seen with tests in the US. So I think, uh, I hope if we can align the interest of the regulators with the end users, and with uh, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, we can really hope for an innovative platform in telecommunications. Uh, and for that, we can build more empowered communications and not what John, one that just exists for data extraction and commodification of the user. That is a really excellent way of concluding our webinar with a great injection of optimism that we all need. Uh, and actually, uh, let me also remind you that this kind of discussions, we will continue them in a couple of weeks at the IGF at the United Nations Internet Governance Forum. We will have a session uh, uh, that will deal with community networks and connectivity as uh, human rights, uh, together also with our friend, with Anatel, we will have uh, the colleague of Vanessa uh, Ronaldo Moer, and we will have Niels as well. Uh, we will release also some publications on this. Then we also have a uh, research project ongoing on sustainable digital transformation that will also release some interesting publications in the coming months on digital transformations in the BRICS countries. So with that little bit of uh, advertisement, I would like to declare this very exciting and fascinating conversation closed uh, i hope we i will see you all to the next uh, cyberbricks webinar and of course the recording of this webinar will be available on cyberbricks.info thank you very much and see you next time ciao ciao
so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.